February 23rd, 2015, we're kicking it off in the trial kickoff. Coalition members here from across the country. This case is important for the patients that need it, but it could also set the template for what legalization will look like for everybody else as well. This is a coalition in effect, a collective national unity that has raised over a quarter million dollars. We're happy to be here today and uh, onward we grow. Okay, welcome back to another edition of Cannabis in Canada with Jason Wilcox. Kicking here, 2015, we are here, we're getting ready for trial, we're jacked up, we're here in new studios, we're going to be broadcasting from here, we got the court coming up, you know, the trial on Monday, February 23rd, and of course on this weekend, the 21st is our big kickoff, and uh, I'm just jacked up about this, and we have none other than Mark Emery himself. Mark, thank you for coming on the show. Well, it's nice to be here. There's a lot to be jacked up about, though. I'll tell you, there's so much to be jacked up. I mean, look at Vancouver. We've got these 60 dispensaries. They're about to be licensed by the city. That's like the city declaring marijuana has been legalized by City Hall, and Vancouver is going to embrace this legalization policy. It'll clearly distinguish itself from the rest of the country, and this is coming down in a couple of months. Yeah, the parliamentary secretary just, I, I actually responded to that on my blog, um, made a video something about that, uh, you know, saying he was opposed to any possible legislation that would allow dispensaries, and I think that that would be a fabulous thing, because I've often said a Colorado model, where you can grow six plants in a free and fair market, is what we need for Canada. Well, that's that. we're going to have to seek that at the federal level. At the local level, we already can grow as many plants as you want, because no one's been busted in Vancouver since I've been home six months ago. Uh, you can grow pot, you can possess it, you can dispense it, sell it, I mean, they have not charged anyone in Vancouver. And now my lawyer reports that he's getting far fewer calls from around British Columbia for the same things. Busts are of grow ops, gardens, they're not really happening as much. So, and here's the other thing, everybody tells me when they've got a new project and they go in the country, I can tell you, in the last week I've spoken to at least 15 people opening lounges up in Courtney, Parksville, um, strange, obscure places, some like Kelowna, not so obscure, Kamloops, but I mean strange, small places like in, uh, you know, Yorkton, Saskatchewan, and, and people are getting nervy. Red Deer, a guy wants open one. So people are getting nervy, they're pushing back. So this is going to be a momentous year. Not only are we going to court on two big things we need to win, but we've got an election coming up, and we've got a lot of our people pushing to make the change happen now. We're impatient. I don't think people are even going to mind going to jail because it's not going to be for very long, and it's not going to be for a very long period that we're going through this prohibition with Alaska and Washington, Oregon, all these states legalizing. BC is just going to, we're picking up that vibe, and we want it to happen here, and people are making it happen. So we don't have the referendum route to go in British Columbia or in Canada, but we've got the civil disobedience route, plus we've got the political organization route, and I think we're, we're well equipped to do well this year in that way. And I also know that there's an underground growers group, not really an underground, but a growers group that's coming out that's a national um, alliance of growers that are also pushing back against you know, any sort of removal of gardens, as well as we're bringing up the fact that the BC economy has been run by cannabis. Well, how do you figure a growers group will work? I, can, I always had a hard time getting the growers to really do anything. This They're no a, good for money. It's a, message, no it's, a message for, it's a message that we need to ask the, the a grower. <laughs> the growing pot thrives in an illegal environment because it's more lucrative that way. And the more closer we get to making it legal or fair or just, the less money's involved. So, you know, we're going to have these conflicts. In the long run, of course, I, money's only important if it's ethically earned and ethically earned in a free market is the ideal circumstance and that will change things for a lot of people but uh, so I'm glad to see the growers are organized but growers with what interest in mind though do they want to legalize um, or what do they I'm want just um, I'm just a person that supports kind of their initiative about the fact that again there's a lot of uh, BC that the people that run these clubs supply the clubs make sure that patients that are getting 50,000 patients are getting served medicine here in BC as a result of these growers their crews and what they do and that in itself how to turn that into a message I don't know all I know is that like you just hit the nail on the head Vancouver's accepting it that means they're accepting those growers well, Calgary is the next big one, too. Calgary, there's a weed store opening up in Calgary. There's people wanting to open lounges in Calgary. Mm. Um, and I'm going to go speak in Lethbridge in Calgary. You got a white hat in Calgary last time. Yeah, you I did. There. And then the mayor, <laughs> the mayor objected to me being white hatted. That's a ceremony that honors people as an official Albertan. And I get, was white hatted after they did the uh, Prince of Wales was white hatted. So they said, the mayor said I was dim diminishing the value of the white hat ceremony. 
Really? But, uh, they never but stripped in the long you run, it might prove to be a fortuitous white hat ceremony that they gave me in Alberta because uh, I think Alberta is going to be the next big pot growing place because all those guys who have houses in Fort Mac and around Edmonton and all those areas up north, now that they're all laid off the oil patch, the only way they can keep those houses going because the value of the house will plummet with the oil patch in, in disarray, the only way they can keep those houses is by growing weed in them. So we're going to see a lot, a lot of people displaced by the oil industry collapse, albeit temporarily, but at least growing weed for the next two or three years. Because okay? the only thing they can do to make the money that they've now not, won't be making. And, and this has been my fear in, you know, with this MMPR uh, coming in, uh, I guess I guess my biggest fear is if we were to legalize, what would your projection be? First, what's your take on the MMPR scheme in general, just in the way it's been set up with, I think, 22 present licensed producers, of which only a fraction can can actually distribute to patients. They're only servicing 10,000 people. And, you know, the federal injunction covers 21,000. Just the BC clubs and, again, the growers support over 50,000 patients. So what's your take on that? Well, I like big money coming into weed because... Uh, Anything that helps us produce more marijuana is good because more marijuana means there'll be a glut and therefore the price will have to come down and that's what we want. We want there to be too much marijuana so that there's price pushed downwards, right? So it can be more affordable. So anything that allows us to increase production of marijuana is a good thing. Now that having been said, there's going to be a lot more licensed providers after this next federal election, whether it's legalized entirely across the border for, or maintained for medical. First of all, none of the licensed providers are making any money. They, 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 they all have way too much security, way too much infrastructure investment, and they, they're playing catch-up. They also don't know how to advertise to a market, or they can't legally advertise to a market. They've got all sorts of problems. A lot of them are losing money, even uh, burning through, you know, their burn rates severe, and they've got huge capitalization, and they don't have any kind of long-term idea of what their profit could possibly be, because we don't know what the environment's going to be. I'll tell you this one, it's going to be more legal each year going by than it is now. Well, There's no way this prohibition is enforceable. See, that's what's making everybody nervous. They're reluctant to give the wrong person any serious jail time for pot, because people are going to say, okay, that's it, enough is enough. Right? You can't send any more people to jail. We're not going to, and judges are going to start telling the government that, too. They're just not going to send any more people to jail. Well, this means we would have to repeal BC, Bill C-10, the conservatives' you know, ominous crime bill. It went from Bill C-26, we defeated it. Bill C-15, we defeated it. Bill C-10, they slipped it through the Senate. But it's there. And the liberals have said nothing about what they're going to do about Bill C-10 if they're going to endorse growing for a legalization model. You'd first have to wipe out Bill C-10 or repeal at least part of it. It's designed more for growing than it is, I think, for... Well, we have to influence any new government as to what policy to make. So I'm not, I'm not too worried. We, the thing is, we know what the conservatives generally feel towards pot, so we need to make sure that the next government is sympathetic to our point of view, and that means showing up to vote for one. Our people don't vote. So the cannabis culture loses a really good opportunity to come together behind one particular party where we can demonstrate, you know, that you might have gotten a quarter million to one million extra votes, and that's going to be a lot in key ridings over the, across the country. So if we can show the Liberals will show up to vote and give money and get involved, then they'll probably listen to us at the table. They'll have to us. That's what they do, right? That's what people do. That's their base. Well, right? that's what I would think that if they were, we were closing in on the election, it's what I've been waiting to hear. It's, I said it uh, on Jeremiah's show there the first time. I just kind of said, you know, I just haven't heard plants. The young liberals, I debated them on the show around plants, and I would love it if, just, if Justin would come out and say, you know what, six plants per house, or six plants per adult, 12 plants per home, um, just like Colorado, just like Alaska and Oregon, and say that that's what we're going to do because there's no crime, there's no fire, there's no mold. So we'll, we're not going to do that. If, if he came out and just said that, you know, I believe a lot of this country would shift. The biggest failure yeah. in this well, MMPR is the approach. You, unfortunately, in politics, you may have to be patient. You and I would think it would be valuable for Justin Trudeau to articulate how we will all be able to grow a few plants in a legal environment. But ultimately, we're going to have to fight over it. So I'm waiting until he forms the government, because the first thing we want to do is get rid of Harper and his hostile point of view and then get to deal with a prime minister who's got a more open point of view, who's willing to listen, who after all, you know, had 338 candidates all pledged to legalize pot too. So, you know, there's some y unanimity here. This is not going to be like a fringe issue. When the government's formed, they'll be expected to legalize pot because it's the one promise they can deliver on. But that term legalize, as we know, like Washington State, you and I discussed this before, Washington State legalized, but you can't grow. 
Colorado legalized, yeah, 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 and but you the can. Thing is everybody's growing in Washington anyway. Nobody's getting charged. No, but my point is, is it's to be in the, those good civilians that don't want to face being charged yeah, and want to truly be legal. The legal is what's reality on the ground. Nobody in Washington is being charged for growing weed, and therefore it is legal to grow. It's not. Doesn't matter if we don't pass a law that says everybody can grow pot. But everybody goes ahead and grows it and doesn't get arrested. That's fine. We can do that. Um, and that's what's happened in Washington. They, they legalize possession and in doing so legalize distribution because who knows if that ounce is being delivered for sale or whatever or you're holding your friend's ounce or who knows. So then it became legal to sell because automatically, right? And then now it's, it's legal to grow because the federal government doesn't go after under 100 plants. I guess my, So I if guess you're growing 99 or fewer plants in Washington state, and the federal government's not going to prosecute those. And well, the state's just not prosecuting growers. Yeah. And they, they may at some point get to that point, but it's already so socially accepted that the police are losing interest in growing. Even the RCMP here do not want to bust people in the same way. For example, now they'll tell people, oh, the Seashell cops, RCMP was just on the air saying he won't allow a dispensary to open up a weeds outlet. He got a lot of negative feedback from the community saying, go to hell, leave us alone. You don't have the right to say that. So now he doesn't know what to say. He just says, well, you know, I've been hearing about it and I, you know, I might have to think up and come up with a new opinion. So now he's prepared to come up with a new opinion because everybody told him don't be such a... So that's what's going to happen. People are going to tell people they're not going to put up with this. this is I'll, I'll just go, I'll just go back to, to just the term legalization just because I, I've been trying for my viewers. They know this for a couple of years now. I've been just trying to explain that legalization without a model is, is a, uh, an open-ended term and to give a politician an open-ended term but is very scary. But I disagree with you there. I disagree. I think take whatever we can get and don't worry about it. We're just going to keep pushing. Well, sure, there Remember, is, there is some progression. of us need to suffer. There is some of us need to go to jail for five years. Other needs people need to be busted. Other people need to lose. So, I mean, because the only way we can make an impression on the whole world is to get their sympathy. So the bad guys have to do stupid stuff to us so we can get the sympathy of the, of the public. So, you know, uh, you know, when, when uh, a Quebec minister says it's okay to strip search a girl because they saw a message about weed on her phone, yeah, go ahead, do that stuff. That, just keep that up because that girl is going to tell, that story will be told a million times and it's going to make you look bad and it's going to make us look good and so you just keep doing all those things. So let's hope we have some adversity. We shouldn't get everything we want right away. We shouldn't get it easy. There, you can't get freedom for what free. Did Colo what did Colorado do that was right that we're doing wrong? Well, they didn't do anything so much as right, but they have a wonderful initiative model. It becomes part of the state constitution. If you get 50% of the voters plus one, they only needed 86,000 people to get on the ballot. Hell, we got 220,000. Dana Larson and Sensible BC got that here. And that's not even good enough to get on the ballot. There, it would have been two and a half times what they required. So you but would say it's political law then? Just basically politics in well, Canada Col are different? Colorado says you can grow six plants. But people who grow six plants in Washington aren't getting busted either. Or for that matter, Alaska. Uh, which has the Colorado model, or, or Oregon. So nobody's getting busted in those places because what happens once the public demonstrates that they're in favor in the majority, like in Florida, they may have lost that because they didn't get the supermajority to pass the medical law in Florida. They got 57% of the people to vote for medical marijuana and 43% vote against it, and that was enough to stop it from being part of the state constitution. But now there's a whole bunch of people in the state house in Florida willing to put up a medical bill because they see 57% of the people want it. Holy, that's a lot of people. All of a sudden, a whole bunch of state representatives are now on board because that's the majority. To be against it means you're against the majority wishes in your state. How long is that politically sustainable? I don't think it's very sustainable. So we we, we just got to keep pushing and realize that now the majority is on our side and it's going to be a bigger majority as every day that goes by. Well, I've been to the Green Rush conferences, so I'd say, yeah, there's a majority that are cashing in just like the, the chief financial officer of the Liberals who's become yeah. a millionaire off Tweed, one of the licensed producers. And how do you become a millionaire off serving only 10,000? And patients, you know, paper pushing, gold digging. No, no, digging. it's all about, uh, see, here's the thing, okay, I might be saying immodest to say that I'm possibly the most well-known cannabis activist in the world, but here's the thing about that. I get people approaching me all the time to tell me, and this one guy went through it, I was curious to know what he meant by this. He said, Mark, what we do is we form a shell company and we buy cannabis culture and we buy a few other assets, basically. Then we go to people and they sort of float you and, and do an initial public offering. He said, my interest is that I make the money along with the early people by selling their stock at a lucrative rate and then, you know, getting out early. And you can make a lot of money that way too. I said, but where then is the long-term viability that we attract all these other people? He says, well, they invest based on the fact that you'd be running this thing and you're a well-known person and you, you can develop a line of weed and this, that, and the other. I said, so 
I've got to make sure that, you know, they make that money, right? And I said, so everybody gets out early, but I'm the guy that really has to make sure this happens or my reputation's at stake. He said, well, of course, but you'd make lots of money either way. And I said, oh, yeah, but he said, that just, I can see that working, I said, but I can just, I just see a lot of people getting out early and something not right about that, right? So anyway, I've declined all these offers because if they exist now, they'll certainly exist in two or three or four years. I'm not desperate for money. I so got if you, if you were, money, if you were offered to get in on an LP um, uh, business, would you go that route? No, I was already offered hundred thousand dollars. So was my I. Name, That's a good number to put my, my name on somebody's stores. Yeah, I was right. offered a hundred thousand to actually uh, toss a coalition case some time ago to go work for Urban LP as a grower. Um, however, it meant that I had to give up my, all my other activities under contract, and I turned that down. Well, and I, I don't mind lending my name to some really great product at some point in the future, but I can't see how that's going to be done under today's circumstances. If I had a, even a strain of weed named after me, I'd want to see how that's been grown, how it's, what it came from. And same with if I was, in, you know, put my name on somebody selling weed. You know, then I'd want to see that weed being grown. I'd want to smoke that weed every day. I'd want to know they were the best, you know. Because then I'd have people telling, I don't want to beat people on the street that said it sucked, right? So <laughs> no amount of money is like that. Fortunately, most people who are fans of mine like the work I've done yeah. for them on their behalf. So I never want money to come between, I mean, I get money now, right, it's from cannabis culture. But at least we do what we want to do and say we're going to do. And we earn it in a way that's very transparent, right? Well, your history, let's be, let's be, I mean, I know your history. And, you know, I remember as a kid in London buying records from you. So you were a political libertarian, you know, yeah, and very yeah. strong. And you, I you fought want, Sunday and I shopping. To talk you, fought, it. you fought Sunday shopping laws. You fought Censorship literature laws. laws you overturned the laws in Canada so we could actually have high times in literature like cannabis culture and drug literature in general. That's you were part of all that. That's the best thing I have. I'd but say I will, I will say, though, there is so much great opportunity coming for all these activists now. I mean, I like to talk to young people and remind them that 25 years ago there was nothing in this country. There were no books, magazines, no bongs, pipes, no head shops. They'd all been pushed out. There was, you couldn't even, Jack Herrera's book was banned. I mean, ironically, of course, about the great conspiracy. So now we live in these really awesome times where there's massive amounts of information. Studies are being done all the time. People, legal jurisdictions everywhere to study. And a public wave of support and intellectual backup that we have now where most the majority of the world's intellectuals want to legalize the majority of people in the united states and canada want to legalize europe has many countries like that too so we're part of this thing that's happening right now it really is well, it's, it's a big it's a global uh, money rabbit right? dr sanjay gupta did it because he explained to everybody that he, well lending back to my my point around cannabis being at the very best a preventative medicine because you could be staying off cancer parkinson's you could be staying off an injury in your knee that you just don't know when you're smoking the cannabis, because you're you're smoking right. it for different reasons, but you are getting medicinal benefits There's by the way your body the uses. Activist of the millennia is Sanjay Gupta. He probably convinced more state legislatures to make medical marijuana legal in some form or another than anybody else. What is it? Five now have made CBD oil for children legal or something. I mean, it's pretty outrageous, but wonderful to see. But did, would you would you did you know that CBD was isolated in the 1800s? And I got a book in my office right now that says that prior to 1942, CBD was isolated for seizures and separated from cannabis sativa and available through pharmacopoeia. So it's not new. Sanjay Gupta is just saying it's kind of new. Right. And the biggest tragedy in this country, because now everybody's discovering CBD oil, and there's a big shortage of it at an affordable price, right? Uh, for people who want to bathe their insides in it, you know, it's pricey. But here's the thing. We throw away tons of CBD oil every year in this country because hemp. all the hemp farmers yeah. um, produce CBD, and they're required to throw it away. So they have all this oil that could be kept and processed that's not psychoactive, but highly medicinally effective as a cannabinoid. And we grow thousands of acres of hemp in Canada, and it's, they're required to destroy all the CBD that they harvest from that. It's absurd, ridiculous. It I'm not sure they do yeah. destroy it. It seems ridiculous that they would be required, but they are required by law to destroy it. Well, it's almost as ridiculous as extractions. I've always said this. The, Dr. Sanjay Gupta shows a baby get saved you know, from being brain smashed from seizures. And yet in Canada, even under the LP scheme, under the MMPR, they can't provide extractions. That's why it takes that us to have weird. to go hey, through the court um, system. What department of the government, the federal government, is in charge of that hemp 
program. Is that the Agriculture you know, oh, Ministry of Ag? That's a good question because I don't grow hemp. Ag Ministry, because I was thinking, you know, somebody, we should get a lobby to change that so we can at least use the CBD. Because well, was, the problem was, with hemp farmers is they're not making enough money on those seeds, really. It's just, you know, it's, it's not that lucrative. But if they could recover the CBD and sell that to the medical people, that would be amazing. For seizures, I mean, I mean, CBD has been proven again. This is why I believe in the holistic cannabinoid profile working with the body. I don't believe isolates alone are the answer, but if you're suffering from seizures and you're a baby, then yeah, high CBD and all that hemp is being wasted. That is high CBD, just like ruderalis. If it's going to be broken down to an extract, you're not smoking, it ain't going to be headache weed, but it's high in CBD. So this is what we know, but again, by the governments here in Canada, we've been legal, me as a medical patient, 13 years, 14, going to our 14th year, but yet Canada still holds that there's no medical value it's to marijuana. Bizarre. Is that not a hypocrisy? The, 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 the courts, see, the courts have ordered the government to provide a program, but not, they can't order the government to change its ideology. Right, but they still hold the official position in our legal documents, Mr. Conroy, under discovery. Health Canada says not only is there a million, first of all, I'll point out again, there's a million estimated medical marijuana users. And the MMPR and some of the licensed producers are saying that it's because of the Allard matter that their MMPR scheme is not working. I would argue how could 40,000 people that the MMPR Allard case represents, 36,000 were growers. So um, that's what the Allard case represents. It's a fraction to the 1 million estimated medical users this program was supposed to help. And it's only helping 10,000. I, no, I believe over time, indeed, things organically grow, indeed. And uh, big money's been brought in. So Saturday, February 21, we're meeting down at Langley. Where are we meeting? We are meeting at, uh, oh geez, in Langley at the hall. I should know the hall because I don't have the poster right in front of you. You caught uh, me off. You I caught thought that me was an guard. in for you to start talking about our event this Saturday. That is an in, but we are doing an event this Saturday. And thank you once again, you're attending our event. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a, a kickoff. It's going to be, um, there's a poster for me coming through the door. So uh, the kickoff is going to be, once again, this is about our fourth um, co coalition concert type event that uh, that we hold. And as you can see, there's numerous sponsors. So sponsor members that, you know, these people here from Ontario gave us $1,000. Um, Beard Brothers do their... Cannabis Avenue is good people, by the way. I send them lots of business. I couldn't so. believe when they donated, they're coming out for the trial. Donated oh, $1,000 donate $1, to, to this kickoff. Just I thought it was great coming out of Ontario. Plus, there's three of these events going off across Canada simultaneously. There's one in Langley, Nelson, and in... Sponsored by Weed Day. Irrepressible Don Briere. Yeah, well, when you're fighting the government, $1,000 from anybody, it doesn't matter. It's a fight where it's we're good. a collective. It's good, no, absolutely. And then there's Rainbow's Nutrients threw in $1,000. And, of course, Cannabis in Canada is in there doing our thing as always. And uh, where was the address? was Murray Hall at 21667 48th Avenue. Of course, by the time this gets aired. It's uh, Murrayville Hall and uh, 48th Avenue in Langley. Yes. And so what's going to go on that night? Well, we got Doja, Poison Corn, and the Ruskin River Band on there. John Conroy is going to be there speaking at, you know, basically at 8.30. And what's interesting about this is that it's two days before John goes into federal court to fight for us in such a huge constitutional challenge, a historical cha change. Like Allard, if won, will forge the difference around any model that, that any politician proposes because if the Constitution of Canada says medical patients can have gardens, they can't turn around and legalize and say everybody else can't. It will right. open up a Section 15 argument of equality. We're all equal before and under the Charter. And this is where if we can get everybody on that page, this case is more than just about patients. It's about plants in Canada. Something we've always said, how do we overgrow the government if we don't have the plants? And why should we give our genetics to a bunch of people when we've been lied to for 70 years? People like yourself have fought for over 40 years to expose the truth, and we're still exposing it. And by their own admission, they don't know enough about the plant to even say it's medical. So this is where it becomes frustrating to me how they not only treated the medical patients, they tried to throw 36,000 medical patients under the bus and say fire mold and organized crime. What are they going to do to the legal people? <laughs>